Okay, it's time for us to start talking about the Cold War, and this is going to be the first part of it, because the Cold War is one of those little threads that's going to permeate American life and politics, society, the economy, just anything you can get your hands on. The Olympics, it's going to permeate it from, you know, basically 1946 through uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is in November of 89, and then later to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the very, very early 90s. Uh, so this thing's going to last, you know, 40-something years. So something that lasts that long, why does it begin? And let's see if we can with some historical context. And you got to go back to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and this idea that, um, you know, they're going to spread worldwide communism, try to take down governments, and, you know, dissolve private property. We see that play itself out with our first Red Scare and the Palmer Raids. When, when you know, we're going, to, we're going to pack people up and send them to Russia, even though they weren't even Russian. Um, you know, then you have some of the, the Soviet violation of human rights during this interwar period. You know, the, the kulaks and the blood purges and all of that stuff. In about 33 or so, there's a, this brief period of cooperation. Cooperation, listen, it made cooperation. And then they will become our ally during World War II. But for most people sitting here, it becomes very hard to distinguish the Soviet tyranny from the Nazi tyranny. And a matter of fact, since the, uh, end of the end of the Cold War and the opening of some of the old Soviet archives, we found out that Joe Stalin, man, he made Hitler look like the JV team when it came to murdering people. Um, and that's a little on the scary side. So those are some of the historical context behind it. I mean, Russia seems a little weird, or Soviet Union, rather, seems just a little weird and not the kind of people we want to get involved with. But they're going to end up with some foreign policy issues that, that kind of exacerbate it. Um, the fundamental difference is, you know, like America is a city upon a hill. You know, we go back to, you know, the, the flagship Arbella where Governor Winthrop said America shall be as a, this, we shall be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of the world will be upon us and that we will become a watchword unto mankind if we don't do our part. Well, that ends up with a foreign policy that's based in moralism or doing what's right. Okay, that's all right. Today, we we probably see it a little bit differently. Our glasses have a little different tint to them. But the Russians is always about self-interest. If it's good for Russia or the Soviet Union, that's what they're going to do, no matter who else is involved. Okay, And if you figure that part out, you figure out what the Soviet Union is always going to do, whether it's Putin, Stalin, whoever it is, you can figure that out. Then you go back to the four freedoms of the Atlantic Charter. And those are just things that are, are, are anathema to communist rule. You know, and that's what America says should happen all over the world. So if you're the Soviet Union, you're kind of looking on that going, hold on a minute there, chief. Um, maybe over across on your side, but not over here on our side of the world. And so you get some of that. And, you know, you get the two biggest kids on the block by 1946, and you got issues brewing. And so you talk about their, their self-interest. Um, it, it's, it's, it's real. It's not idealism. It doesn't matter. Uh, the enemy of their enemy is their friend. If it helps them in any way, shape, or form, such as uh, the, the Soviet Nazi pact is, is a great example. Uh, why did they jump in bed with Hitler, so to speak, for a little while? Uh, because they needed to. Uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk at the end of World War I um, or at the end of their World War I, you know, why do they sell out the Allies in our eyes in their eyes, it was called, hey, you know what, we we did not want the, the, the next government to topple. Uh, we were getting nothing out of the war. It was not in our interest to be in it. It was in y'all's interest. So that's part of it. So there's some foreign policy. Then you go to the war years. And there were three major areas of problems or conflict. And a lot of these are perception rather than reality. Um Now, the reality is that the Soviet Union does bear the brunt of the war against the Nazis. They do. Um, that's just that's just a fact because Hitler could get his hands on them. He couldn't get his hands on us until we get across the channel. And by that time, he had a problem. We, the Russians, they, we were late opening a second front. And if you remember me talking about the business of going through North Africa and then Sicily and then Italy, uh, listening to Winston Churchill, who was really jealous of the Russians and FDR wanting to treat them as equals and, and, and whatnot. I mean, it's it's kind of weird. Boy, did, did, Winston Churchill acts like the jealous friend there. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, one of those teenage dramas. So there's that. I'm in the second front, which came late. And then there was a question of how to make peace. And you go back, we had, had Yalta, and then we had Potsdam, and, and Russia makes some 
promises and then they break them. And then America says, hey, you got to give up Poland. He says, well, if that's the case, then y'all got to get up Italy. And we're like, uh, no, your book, <laughs> your book didn't mention the Italy part, I noticed. But that's okay. So there's some questions about how to, how to, how to wage the peace, too. And they, we don't see eye to eye. Russia had been invaded twice in the last 30 years, and they weren't going to get invaded a third time. And if you start to look at it from their perspective, it makes sense. We don't agree with it. it sense. And so there's a question of then of American support. And were the allies, basically, i.e. America, doing enough? Stalin never got enough. He's like a kid eating ice cream, man. He never gets enough till you know, to the end of it. And we know that there were definite problems in producing and shipping lend lease supplies. We couldn't get them there fast enough. Then the Russians didn't know what they were doing with them. Lord, we'd send over those big, uh, what you might call now a deuce and a half truck. And back in the days of carburation and, and, and lower quality fuel, spark plugs fouled out, and you had to take them out and change them or clean them. Russians never would. They'd run the truck till it wouldn't run anymore, throw it on the side of the road and say, hey, we need some more. Um, you know, it, it, it really pains me that my sons will never understand how, how to set the timing on a car with a timing light and that kind of stuff because you can't do it anymore. Well, the Russians didn't do it back in the 40s. And so what this leads to is this belief that America is trying to shortchange them, especially when you've got some politicians who are hollering about how the Germans need to kill more Russians. And when they, and when they beat the Russians, then we'll beat up on the Germans. It's, you, you, you just don't do stuff like that. I mean, you know. And so that's getting in the Russians' heads because they don't understand that the American press is much freer and that our policies on speech are much freer and people like that don't go to jail. So they're assuming that stuff is official policy. <laughs> Talk about a mess. And we already know about that second front and getting involved and blah, blah, blah. And, and Stalin wants it in 42, and we're not doing that. But imagine if it hadn't. There would be no leverage. And that was there was a lot of leverage in 1945. Matter of fact, Churchill is going to try to get Eisenhower to race to Berlin in 45 rather than let the Russians take it. Now, Eisenhower kind of backed off of it. He said, no, that's not part of the plan. But... um. You know, so we've got some problems. So making the peace is going to be the decisive issue. And the question is, who's going to control the area seized by the Allies? And like I said, Italy and Poland are going to become the focal point. Though Poland becomes the biggest one, and we kind of tend to forget about Italy because we're Americans. And then the Atlantic Charter says, man, we need to have some democratic governments installed. Well, the, you're Joe Stalin. You've just lost tens of millions of people. And all of a sudden, we're saying, you got to let these people vote on the government? He's like, not so fast, you bunch of chumps. And so what you get is the different systems of foreign policy on both sides. And so FDR, they're at the last at Yalta. The man is like death sucking on a lifesaver, and he gives in. Because the problem is, how are we going to get the Russians out of Poland? You can't. Not unless you go to war. How are you going to get the Americans out of Italy? You can't unless the Russians go to war. So wherever you are, that's what you're going to get. Now, that's going to lead us into some fun over on the Korean Peninsula, or as we should say it as the old people say, Korea. So this leads us to something called real politic, or real politic, depending on how fancy you want to be with it. Why were they our allies in World War II? Because we needed somebody to help us beat the Germans. And if they hated us so bad, why do they ally with us? They needed somebody to help get them to stuff to beat the Germans with. Now the enemy's no longer there. Hitler's took a nine millimeter to the head. The rest of the Nazis are getting round up and hanged by the neck until dead. So now what? Where does it come from? Boom. Five major areas accepted by most historians. One is the issue of Poland. What to do about it? We're supposed to have free elections. Stalin's like, eh. Then there's the other ones, Estonia and Latvia and all those uh, all those other places. Eh, going to be communist and beholden by man Stalin. Now what we're going to do with Germany? We would agreed at, at Yalta and Potsdam to divide that son of a gun up. But also we're going to have to divide up the city of Berlin, which is actually in the Soviet sector. So what's this future going to be? The Russians want it to stay divided and weak and to be a pastoral land and don't want it to have any industry. And uh, Henry Morgenthau, the American Secretary of the Treasury, wants it to be like that, too. He was the only Jewish person in FDR's cabinet, and he doesn't want the Germans coming back again, either. So how are we going to re economically reconstruct Europe? America's going to start handing out loans, and the Russians are actually going to ask for one. 
about $2 billion worth. And, the, and it mysteriously gets lost. And so, again, it's like the Russians are going, stupid Americans are wanting to put the crank down on us. They don't want us to survive. And so that was a, a great missed opportunity to, to throw an olive branch out there. Now, it's not all, all America's fault. Please, dear God, don't ever get me wrong. Most of it is the balkanized, insular, and paranoid nature of the Soviet Union. But then you got to add to that the atomic bomb issues. We told the British we were building it. We never told Stalin even though he knew because he had a lot of spies in the old Manhattan Project. But now all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's like when it explodes in Alamogordo in July of 45, and Truman tells Stalin about it. Stalin didn't really react. He already knew. So what about the next five decades, nearly 50 years? you got the Eastern Bloc called the Iron Curtain, and we're going to get to that in just a second, with their goal to be kind of generic, to spread worldwide communism. Boom, you like that little explosion sound. Then you get the U.S. and the Western democracies, and I'm going to use that term loosely, and our goal is containment of communism. And that's from George S. Kenan, or Kenan, the, the containment policy. We're going to keep it where it is. Kind of like if you get poison ivy, you don't want it spreading. And we're going to use a lot of different methods. You know, we got the KGB and the CIA. The KGB's got, I think it's called the FSB now, same stinking thing. Um we're going to have a nuclear arms race that's going to culminate in each side having between nine and 10,000 independently targetable warheads aimed at each other. There's going to be ideological competition, everything from uh, the Olympics all the way to things that you can build and technological advancements. It's crazy. Then there's going to be proxy wars in places like the Middle East and Southeast Asia, over here in Central America, all over to control those hearts and minds. And then you get a, a bipolarization of Europe where you have NATO on one side and the Warsaw Pact. on. So the Cold War comes into full bloom relatively early by the by the you know end of the 1940s you know about 47 40, 48 especially no you end up with some ideological struggle and we've already talked about the spread of communism we've got that you know we did the same why do i have the same slide on here twice i must have had a reason for it back in the day but we already know it so what you have is two superpowers emerge and so i thought i'd use superman as my bullet right there there's only two that really grow and prosper due to the war there's really only one and that's America. But the Soviet Union comes out of it stronger than its surrounding people. So, And it wants to look like it's tough. Um, and you get the old guard, the, the, the Britons, the Francis, the Germanies. They, they, they're declined. They, they, they're surrogates of one of the two. And it just depends on which side they fall into. And then smaller countries uh, you become part of the superpower spheres of influence. And it becomes a mess. You're either part of the American sphere or you're part of the Soviet sphere. Unless you're Switzerland, which they do whatever the heck they want to anyway. Because nobody messes with Switzerland. Because they make watches and chocolate. At Potsdam, you know, in July of 45, the idea was we're going to govern, ger govern Germany as one country. But then, pff, nah, no, let's just divide up into four zones of occupation. And, you know, until 1989, it is, or actually 90, I think the wall comes down to 89, but it's 90 before they reunite. It becomes those four zones of occupation with the three American, British, and even the little French zone combined into West Germany, and the Soviet zone becomes East Germany. So it's a split country for so long. And then I talked to you about Henry Morgenthau and his plan to make Germany just a pastoral, agricultural country, which is so against what it's always been. But old Uncle Joe had a desire for reparations. We heard the song and dance before during World War I. Um, and we're going to allow him to strip Germany of God knows what, all this industrial equipment and stuff like that. Um, so he's going to do that until he figures out he really needs East Germany as a bulwark against uh, you know America and the American side. Um, and then we're going to have a military occupation for an indefinite period. Matter of fact, we still have soldiers over there. It's not an occupation anymore. Um, but it was for a while. And then you flip do something with the Nazis. Um, you can't run around doing what they did. So they had to be punished for those atrocities. Um, but every one of them, notice I got a noose is the, is the bullet here. And there's a reason for that. Because this is what's going to happen to many of them. They're going to hang. They said they were just following orders. Well, the court at Nuremberg refused to accept that. And so here you get 12 that are hanged. I mean, there you go. That's not a whole lot, but that's a lot of stuff. But these things weren't even crimes in 1940. And while we look at Nuremberg as a very positive thing, in reality, what it does is it tells everybody, you've got to win the war. 
because if you don't, these kind of things are going to happen. But I, I'm losing no sleep over Herman Gurian in the upper right, killing himself with cyanide or some of the rest of these guys hanging by the end of a rope. With what they did, I got no issues with it. I sleep good at night. But anyway, we need to go to a theory for a second. Spent an, almost an entire some summer class in college talking about the hegemonic stability theory. And so there it is. And it's got a central idea. And this is really simple. It was a fancy name, but it's simple. Think about it. you got to have a dominant state. And that one dominant country makes sure everybody else does what they're supposed to. I.e. America and Soviet Union. We got our side, you got your side. We'll make sure our side stays in line. You say, make sure your side stays in line. That way we don't start shooting and nuking each other. That's what it is. That's the whole hegemonic stability theory in a nutshell. Matter of fact, we're not even going to worry about the attributes, the capability to enforce the rules. Yeah, America can do that. You've got to have the will. You've got a commitment to a system that's mutually beneficial. Blah, blah, blah. Check it out. You've got to have a large growing economy. Dominance in technology. You know, political power backed by military power. Well, America can do all that. And the Soviet Union could for the longest time, though they can't anymore. And that really just ticks them off and makes them so mad they can't see straight. So we're looking at hegemonic world war now. And so now you get this bipolar or two poles, the American pole, the Soviet pole. And I think I've said that enough now, you're probably sick of it. But what happens is most nations have to fall within that sphere. But the funny thing is, you think with two sides loaded for bear, ready to kill each other, nuke each other, that it would make things less safe. But it doesn't. It actually makes them more stable. Because ain't nobody chunking nukes at each other. Okay, because that's when you get millions of people, tens of millions of people dead. But what happens in the meantime is Stalin's going to tighten his control over what's called the Iron Curtain, or his half of Europe. And that is a sweet little cartoon there, Winston Churchill trying to look under it, no admittance by order of Joe. He's going to do this in a speech. And he's going to do it in Fulton, Missouri, in 1946. And you used to have a good little video of it, and I've lost it. I mean, because you could hear Winston speak, because he's pretty cool. Remember, he's got an American mother and a British father, so he loves him some America. But you hear it, and his voice is even better. But from Stettin in the Baltic to Twist in the Adriatic, an iron cutting has descended across the continent. Behind that line lies the ancient capitals of Central and Eastern Europe. And it's unfortunate that I have lost that video. One of these days, I'll have to find it again. Then, let's add to that. And this is the idea of containment policy, that we've got to contain communism within its current borders. And it has two parts to it. One, you got to have the military part with the Truman Doctrine. We're going to see that here in just a little bit. And then the second part is economic. The other half of the walnut, so to speak, the Marshall Plan. Okay, so what is the Truman Doctrine for just a second? You know, there was a civil war going on in Greece, and Turkey's under pressure from the Soviet Union. And what ends up happening is these two countries need our help. So what does Harry Truman say? 47. This is still in his second term. Oh, sorry, second. Listen to me. His first term. That America should support free peoples throughout the world who are resisting takeovers by armed minorities or outside pressure. Look at that. We must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. Boom. And so we give him $400 million. Rick, where'd you get a hand grenade? I don't know. Rick, where'd you get a hand grenade? I don't know. And there's an excerpt from Ron Burgundy. So there you go. Anchorman. What's that I have is the Marshall Plan. Named after, you know, used to be the commander of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, George Marshall. Now he is American Secretary of State. And it's officially called the European Republic, European Recovery Program. And there he is. But what does it do? It said that the United States should provide aid to all, notice I've underlined it, European countries that need it. It says it's not against any country or doctrine or anything else, but rather it's against hunger and poverty and desperation and chaos. Everything. Okay, now remember, some of you asked us for $2 billion a couple of years ago. We just kind of ignored it. Now we offer them this money and they kick it out. And George Marshall there is the man who really wins the Second World War militarily for America. Um, but he's a pretty cool guy. One time, President Roosevelt, early on, they were at, a, at, a, at a, some kind of function, and he slapped old General Marshall on the back and said, how's it, how's it going, George? 
And he stiffened up and he said, that's General Marshall, Mr. President. <laughs> you just don't do that to the president, but George Marshall could and got away with it. And that's why there's a humongous statue to him at Virginia Military Institute to this day. But in the meantime, this cartoon kind of sets things in motion. <clears throat> set things in motion. Listen to me. It kind of sets things in a frame of reference. Western Europe's scared of the Russian bear, okay? And that Marshall Plan, the longer it's delayed, the scared they're going to get. So that always like this one because it looks like Elmer Fudd's gun. Uh, just supposing a fellow met up with a bear. And there's the Russian bear up at the top right coming over Norway. And so the things America is going to have, thinks they have to do this in order to protect Western Europe. There's an element of truth in that. That's the first half. And then post-war Germany becomes the thing. So there's all of these little avenues into that Soviet zone, into Berlin that were supposedly guaranteed until Stalin gets mad. He decides to blockade Berlin. He wouldn't shoot anything down, but he blocked the road. So if we run the roadblock, they're going to shoot at us and claim we're trying to invade. But when we flew plane, cargo planes full of stuff in, if Stalin shot him down, he started the war. And at this time, America has a tremendous technological superiority with atomic weapons. So it kind of ends with Stalin stopping it. But it does lead to an incredible arms race, especially when the Soviet Union explodes their first bomb in 49. Now, of course, this is an ice, a minute man. No, that's not a minute man. That's an MX missile right there from a much more modern one. But now you've got two nuclear superpowers, and it's going to continue to spread. And so now this concept of fallout and radioactive war is very real and very scary. So you end up with two distinct camps. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, that's still around even though it doesn't do quite what it used to. And it's got more people than what I've got on here in it. Warsaw Pact a few years later. And so that's a raid in Europe. But the Cold War doesn't stop at the borders of Europe. The Cold War is going to continue into China, where Chairman Mao, who had been fighting Chiang Kai-shek back before World War II, then here come the Japanese. So they stop fighting for a second to fight the Japanese, and they fight each other some more, is going to end up running the nationalists out of China. And so big old Chairman Mao there become, takes China as a communist country. I mean, oh my God, the most populous country in the world is now communist. The biggest country in the world, the Soviet Union, is communist. So the thing comes, who lost China? And that becomes a problem for a while. Who loses China? So we can't lose anymore. So we have to go over beside to the Korean War, or to the Korean Peninsula, rather. We have Kim Il-sung, who's Kim Jong-il today. That's his grandpa right there. Kim Jong, because Kim Jong, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong, Kim Jong-il, then Kim Jong-un. Don't quote me on that, but hey, anyway. And then Sing Mon Ri down there, who looks like somebody out of a like 1940s movie. But what ends up happening is you come up with this idea known as the domino theory, and we generally apply that to Vietnam. But we're going to apply that to Korea. Because what happened is Kim Il-sung knew that South Korea military was weak, that the Americans didn't have much of a presence there, that their nearest big military force was in Japan, which is over here about, right about where the left cheek of Sing Mon Ri is, you know, as he's facing us, the left, I mean, almost off, off the page right there. And they thought they could invade, get it done, have Korea united as one communist country instead of divided at the 38th parallel, which is the yellow line. And so what happens is China's like, yeah, go ahead. Soviet Union's back here going, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't need to do that. But China said, yeah, so you see a growing split between the Chinese communists or the Chacoms and the Soviet communists. The Soviets are like, we don't want no part of this. China's like, go ahead, knock yourself out. And so you end up with a conflict here. Oh, there's Kim, uh, 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 Kim Jong-il. Oh, Kim Jong-un. Anyway, one of them. And then you have the specter of thermonuclear war sits over the entire thing, because if this gets out of hand, we're going to start nuking one another. Matter of fact, General MacArthur says we ought to drop a few atomic bombs on China. Now, talk about scary. Um, that, makes, you know, that makes a lot of things very different when you do it. With this Korean conflict here, what's going to happen? And I keep calling it police action, because it's not, war is never declared. And uh, Dean Acheson, 
in his perimeter speech is going to draw a big circle around parts of, you know, Pacific nations that we're going to attack and we're not going to not let communism invade this area. Well, Korea was outside of the perimeters. Oh my goodness. Anyhow, so we got to contain it. And the 30th parallel is where it's divided. And uh, the, you know what happens is the UN Security Council holds a vote that we need to send troops in to do this. And the Soviet Union could have um, voted against it, stopped it, and not had a UN mandate, but they were ticked off about God knows what that day and decided not to vote. They weren't there to vote when they didn't vote. Guess what? Now we got a UN, an entire UN devoted to this thing. But it's almost an allied defeat because the North Koreans come screaming out of the North and America can't get soldiers over there in time. And so we end up back at the Pusan perimeter, which is way down here, just to the left of the big number two. And then we have to start pumping stuff in, pumping stuff in. And Douglas MacArthur comes over and he takes command. And then he has an amphibious assault at Incheon, which is absolutely ingenious and almost a disaster. But once he lands in behind the North Koreans, they start running back up through North Korea. And when they start running back up through North Korea, they get way too close to the Yalu River that you see just above the R in Korean. And so here comes the Chinese. And so the thing settles back down to the brown near close to the 38th parallel. Are you ready for a war? In the car. Are you ready for a war? Arthur wants President Truman to turn him loose to, to, to do gold. Are you ready for a war? And as you can hear from Braveheart, he's ready for a war. And MacArthur and President Truman get in a tiff, and Truman fires him, proving once again that civilian, that civilian control earned from the old Korean conflict. Number one, America's committed to the containment of communism. Everywhere. That's everywhere. Number two, it ain't easy. Even on the best of it's not easy. And it's hard to fight a limited war. And if you've seen The Princess Bride, you don't get in the land war in Asia. This thing comes, we end up in a stalemate, and there's an armistice to this very day. And it's going to last the end of Truman's second term. And Eisenhower's going to have to deal with it in part. And his, his own son's over there fighting, believe it or not. Talk about a mess. So we get some lessons there. And one of the American commanders there, named name was Matthew Ridgway, who was at the Battle of the Bulge. He's going to be a big-time leader in the Korean War. And then later on, he's going to tell President Truman, President Eisenhower, if you gave him 500,000 men, he couldn't assure victory in Vietnam. And that's going to be a very prescient thought. So anyhow, so we're good with this first part of the Cold War. There is much more to come, but it's going to be in the 1950s, and that's going to be next week. So thank you all over the military is supreme in America. And that's a great thing because Kennedy's going to really need it during the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis later. So